this computer. Okay. Well, good evening. Good, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Whenever you are, wherever you are, it's wonderful. I'm recognizing names from, from uh, pretty much half the planet, which is beautiful. Uh, my name is Ilaria Scaglia, and I'm based at Aston University in Birmingham, although right now I'm in a place slightly north of that, where I, where I live at home, like most of us in these circumstances. And uh, uh, I'm in England. And uh, I'm joined by Paul Kramer, who's uh, a Vanderbilt in Nashville. Uh, and I'll introduce him more properly in a moment. This is a session, as you know, on uh, launching your first book, especially tailored for a particular time. And you should know that this is the extended version of a session that we have already um, ran a few weeks ago for the Coordinating Council for Women in History. And I happen to represent that as well. Um, and the Coordinating Council is actually uh, open to people of all gender. It's not just uh, for women, but it is an, an organization meant at helping the status of women in the profession. And uh, it runs a mentorship program you might be interested in. These are mentorship sessions. You can find them um, uh, fairly easy if you just type up CCWH mentorship and uh, um, on all topics from finding a job to what you should know before agreeing to become the chair of your department to what is you should be thinking about before you retire, to what happens before tenure, what happens after tenure, how to get through a tough day or a tough uh, year or career uh, in a post uh, that might be challenging and so on. So it's something I invite you to, to consult. And through that, you can find notes from a shorter session that we ran with Paul Kramer a few weeks ago. This one though is gonna be much longer and it is gonna be tailored to a particular situation. So before starting, just as a technical note, I would like to ask you to turn off your camera because it, it slows down the connection for, for many people and we're gonna have a large crowd. And maybe to mute your mic uh, because otherwise Zoom will, will uh, alternate windows. But at any point during this time, you can ask questions, clarifications, just throw them in the chat. You find it, if you hover at the bottom, you find the button chat and just throw them in there. I will be monitoring the chat uh, and ask the question as soon as I can, you know, sneak them in and maybe compile them. Try maybe to keep them short so I don't get distracted <laughs> reading a, a, long, a long paragraph. But please, please intervene. This is really meant to be informal. It's meant to be helpful, above all. It's meant to be really this no-nonsense, concrete moment when we can get together and really make sense of uh, what we're doing. So again, if you can please turn off the camera and uh, mute the mic and, uh, and we can get formally started. So Paul Kramer, in reality, we, most of us already know him because he, He's in our exam reading list. He was when we took our exams and then his writings reappear in different forms at different points of, of what we do. And so his work is very well known. But tonight is really the experience with the blood of government, right? The, the, the big, big book that he, he wrote. And, and you know, how, how uh, he approached uh, launching that, you know, when it happened and how now with the wisdom of uh, a few years later in understanding also how academia has evolved in the moment in which you are in, how we should be thinking about um, the first book, the best way to uh, promote it before um, actually it's published and then right after it's published and how to think about this process. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over and then he knows me very well, so he knows I'll, I'll interject often as I always do. But please, Paul, uh, <laughs> take, it, take it away. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Ilaria. Um, so, yeah, I'm so glad that you all can make it. And, uh, and I want to thank Ilaria and the CCWH uh, for the original idea for a session on this theme that you mentioned a month ago. Um, and I'd also like to thank the many uh, historical organizations that help get the word out uh, to folks. Um, so, uh, yeah, Ilaria said this will be a longer talk. I'm actually trying to keep it relatively uh, compressed so that we can maximize time for discussion um, and so you can kind of tailor uh, the information to the kind of questions you have in your own situations. Um, but just to um, just start off with some kind of prefatory comments about why this talk now. I mean, aren't we all supposed to be thinking and taking action on much more urgent things? Um, and on one level, absolutely, and I'm sure many of us are. Um, but I also want to begin with you know, an important philosophical point that I think can be uh, easy to lose sight of at a moment like this, or at least that I find uh, I sometimes lose sight of, which is that scholars are a crucial part of the truth-seeking infrastructure of a society, um, that we need to all be doing our part to keep the society as an accurate account of itself, including its history. And so, uh, and that's really important, and it's not gonna happen on its own. Um, 
And so it means that, you know, even as in our own individual ways, we are struggling to save democracy and society, um, we also need to think about how we get our work done, uh, which also includes how we build and sustain intellectual community. And for me, that's really what I see uh, getting your first book out is really being about, is about the process of, and we tend to think of it as being about, you know, advancing our own careers and et cetera, but, and it's certainly about that, but it's also about a necessary process in the building and the interweaving of a denser and richer intellectual community. Um, um, so, uh, you know, there's also, frankly, an emotional side to this, which is that anticipating our first books coming out is generally uh, a really exciting and happy making moment for an individual scholar. Of course, it's also nerve wracking and stressful, but it's also one that we look forward to. And at a time that's so exhausting and full of foreboding uh, for many of us, um, it just feels to me like it might be a good moment to focus briefly on something positive and forward looking that we can do as a group. Um, so as Laurie mentioned, I'm basing these comments on my own experiences um, and kind of what I've seen for better and for worse in academia um, during my career. Um, and I'll start by confessing that I'm made a little crazy by this part of academia, the self-promotional part of it. Uh, I know it's important and it's not intuitive. And uh, my hope is to share some in insights that would be uh, productive. Um, you know, my own sense is that there's a huge amount of practical advice that doesn't really get shared in the profession, but that we all need. And so my hope is that, you know, uh, that this will remedy that. I feel like that kind of information should be really open source as much as possible. And so this talk is an effort in that direction. Uh, in terms of what I'm going to present, I'm going to present a range of possibilities. Uh, which I'm guessing you may want to adapt to your particular situation in terms of your time, uh, your resources, the resources of your institution, your comfort levels in terms of getting out there and talking about your work. Also the timing, I realized corresponding with some of you that some of you already have books that are uh, about to come out. Some of you are looking down further down the horizon. So you're gonna obviously want to adapt some of what I'm presenting to your specific uh, needs, but I'm gonna try to present a kind of holistic approach to give you lots of options to think about. Um, these are also just one person's perspectives. And I think you, know, you may wanna consult with mentors, advisors, colleagues for other suggestions about other uh, ideas beyond what you're getting here. Um, so uh, I'm gonna tailor my advice to our particular situation, um, both things that I think are likely to remain more or less the same and also things that are likely to change temporarily or permanently. Um, we're clearly heading into a new world when it comes to the financial ability of institutions like universities and academic presses to help us promote our book. Uh, for example, the resources to pay to bring us to give campus talks, for example. Um, but we're also, I think, heading into some new and exciting possibilities with respect to this particular part of academia, even as obviously lots of other structures are really in crisis. You know, through technologies like Zoom, um, our ability to communicate our work to others may actually make it easier, uh, particularly with low costs, uh, logistical tangles and overhead that conventionally made book talks kind of hard to set up. So, you know, it's easy um, and justifiable in lots of respects to think of uh, this moment as one of real crisis, but I think on this narrow question of getting information out about your work and exchanging with other scholars about it, I do feel like there are some real possibilities here that we can think about in a kind of, um, in a kind of positive way. Um, now we're clearly just starting in terms of the, the, the rules and the etiquette of Zoom and inter, you know, of sort of uh, electronic exchange on this. Um, uh, you know, but, I, but uh, you know, so let's talk a little bit about what some of that might be involved. Um, but I do think that, that you know, there are, in some ways, the culture of sharing your first book may actually be becoming enhanced because of the situation as more and more people realize that the friction involved in bringing people to campus is, is being diminished. So, um, okay. So first, just to begin, it's, you know, it's not a bad thing if promoting your book doesn't come naturally to you. Um, like most things in academia, there are lots of ins and outs. It can be hard to find someone who's familiar with them and who's willing to sit down with you and pass them along. Um, so a first suggestion is to not be bashful about this. Um, this is a time to really share your work and get it out there. There are lots of really good books that get lost in the shuffle. There are awful books that we know of that take up all the oxygen. 
Um, unfortunately, the fantasy that your work is going to get out there just because it's really good and because you put a lot of work into it is an unfortunate fantasy. Good work still needs a nudge. Um, that said, you need to have a sense of proportion. Um, there are a lot of other things going on and lots of other things your colleagues are doing apart from helping you promote your book or reading your book. So when it comes to asking people to help you promote your book, it's important not only to not cross a boundary, but to not even come close to crossing a boundary. Um, so I think keeping the, the real importance of, of trying to assert your, your book, uh, but not treading on people's toes, uh, I think that's an important balance to kind of strike. Um, one important point overall, in my experience, is that the press that you're publishing with is unfortunately not going to do that much to promote your book beyond the minimum, um, or at least relative to what you may want them to do. They don't have the time, they don't have the staffing. Uh, there are a lot of uh, constraints there. This depends a little bit on the press. Bigger presses may end up doing less and figure that what you're getting out of working with them is the prestige of the press and their ability to market in general, but they may be doing less to kind of individually tailor a campaign to your book. Um, so this is gonna be on you. Um, and, uh, and I think that's just something to kind of, you know, the press may be your ally, they can really be helpful, but in terms of taking this kind of initiative, it may end up really being on you. Um, in terms of the structure of my comments today, I'm going to start with preparations you can make before the book is out. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to things you may want to do for when your book is coming out. And then I'll finish with a discussion of book talks, uh, both uh, on Zoom and, and in person. Okay, so first preparations before your book comes out. Uh, so the first step, I think, if you have a certain amount of lead time is to set up conference presentations. Uh, you can try to set up uh, these up at key conferences in your field that will be at about the time that your book is coming out. This is a chance to remind people in the audience uh, when you're introduced to keep an eye open for your forthcoming book and they could get a 20 minute snapshot from you of what it's about and why it's interesting. And I think this is a key opportunity. People who show up to your panel are by definition, people who will have self-selected to hear you speak. So this is a really great opportunity to reach really potentially interested and invested audiences. Um, another thing you can try to do is to try to time an academic article to come out, ideally a few months before your book is scheduled to launch. But the precise timing isn't that important. You can figure this out based on your book publisher's timelines, the estimated review times for journals, with the understanding that journals are not a sure thing, that there's peer review, so you can't assume that, that you know, just because you're working along a conventional timeline of publication that it's necessarily gonna work out. Uh, but it's definitely worth trying for. This can obviously also help you when it comes to getting promoted for tenure. A lot of uh, you know, uh, departments are gonna want not only the book, but some academic articles. Um, uh, presses are not going to mind if you publish a couple of articles from the book, as long as it doesn't extend beyond, I would say, a third of the book. But you're going to want to check with your editors for the specific limits here to make sure you're not getting into, into kind of hot water with your editors. Um, so another thing to do before the book comes out is to, you know, let your friends know ahead of time about when your book is coming out. Um, and it's okay to gently suggest, especially to close friends, uh, that your book is coming out around next time and that you would love to come and visit or to zoom in if there's some opportunity. Uh, people do this, but you're going to want to do it, as I said, very gently. Um, in the best case scenario, the university of your friend or colleague might have a speaker series or an upcoming event in which your visit might make sense in topical terms, and you'll be jogging your friend's memory, and they'll kind of put two and two together. They might actually be looking for an exciting speaker on your themes, and if them out by kind of reminding them that your stuff is coming out. Um, it's also easy to realize that your friends and colleagues can also lose track of this. We all have our own stuff to move forward. And so even if they attended without prodding to bring you out, they may just have slipped their mind. So, you, you know, by kind of reminding them uh, gently again, uh, you know, there's no harm in that, I think. Um, now, I would say you only do this with people that you have a kind of ongoing collegial relationship with in the profession. Uh, and it's especially easy to do it, I think, if your friend or colleague has rhetorically cracked the door open a couple of times with the kind of rhetorical, a more than polite, hey, we should really bring you out to campus sometime over the years. You know, if, if you remember them saying that multiple times, then you can assume they mean it. And if you jog their memory and say, hey, that book we've been talking about is, 
is coming out, uh, that feels completely um, you know, legitimate to do. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Very quickly. Could you just speak a little bit closer to the mic? Because at times you fade a bit in and out. Let me uh, can... again. Um, sorry. I'll plug in my just slightly. I think it's the enthusiasm. We both are movers in any case. Okay, yeah. And again, as it's, as it's getting set up, I repeat what I say early. Uh, please don't, don't, don't hesitate to type in the chat if you have question or clarification. It's really not interrupting. I'll, uh, I'll reappear in my video whenever needed and it'll get the hint that I'm about to hop in. So. Okay, is I'll that be better? Is that much? Is that? Okay, terrific. Yep. Okay. Um, so again, you really have to monitor the boundaries here. Don't, for example, cold call people that you don't know and say, I would look forward to an opportunity to speak at your institution and I'll pay my own way, et cetera. Um, and this may sound outlandish, but this has happened to me multiple times where I get an email from someone that I don't know who's essentially inviting themselves to my university. Um, this is obviously really presumptuous and it also communicates that the person doesn't really know that hosting uh, a, a visitor is not just about money, that it is about logistical energy, the host expending local energy to bring their colleagues out to the talk, setting up a dinner, et cetera. So I put this out there, you know, junior scholars are far less likely to do this in my experience than very senior scholars. Um, but it's important, I think, to get into good habits early on. So that's really, I think, um, outside the line. Um, Okay, other things that you can do before, uh, before the book comes out. Uh, setting up a good, basic, professional website. Um, you can obviously do this inexpensively. You can put up quick book summaries. Um, if you do this ahead of time, you might even be able to have the press send the URL out with their notifications um, so that it directs readers both to their own website and to yours, although the presses may not want to steer people away from their own website, but that's certainly something you can look into. Um, you can contact university publicity and social media offices that are increasingly being set up to help you with this kind of stuff. Um, universities get a lot of bad publicity and they want occasions for good publicity, um, you know, to send out the fact that they are a productive research oriented um, institution. And so helping you get your work out there can overlap at that particular place with the, re with the university's own agenda. So if your university has such an office, and they'll set up an appointment with you, sit down with them a couple of months before your book comes out and talk with them about your work. Um, and, and they'll ask you probably about, you know, you know, headline relevance in ways that, you know, does your research connect to any contemporary themes, et cetera. If there's some um, plausible contemporary relevance, they may do a quick talking head video that they can put up on the university website, et cetera. They can come up with a press release. They can make connections with alumni publications, et cetera. Um, so if, you're, if your university or college has this kind of office, I would certainly take advantage of this. Unlike many people whose boundaries you really need to pay attention to, to help you when you're talking about promoting your book, this is the office of, of the publicity's job. Um, and so they should be eager to sit down with you and come up with a university-centered publicity strategy that can overlap with your own interests. Um, okay, so one final thing uh, before the book comes out, and that's just um, uh, submitting your book for prize competitions. The press usually takes care of this, and you identify on a form, you know, which prizes you think you might be eligible for. If the press doesn't, for some reason, give you uh, a list or a form and ask you to do that, you can ask them, but that's something that they should take care of to make sure that your book is going out to relative prize competitions. Um, okay, so turning to when the book uh, comes out, like the kind of in the lead up to the actual publication. Um, so you're gonna wanna uh, potentially give the press a list of colleagues that will likely be interested um, uh, in the book. And uh, these will be people that the press will send either a paper or an electronic notification to. And I think we've all probably gotten in our inboxes, uh, paper or electronically notifications saying, um, you know, this book is out, here's how you order it, et cetera. Um, you know, presses are gonna vary in terms of how they take care of this, but this is something that, that you know, the press uh, should be uh, checking in with you about. Um, you're gonna wanna confirm with your editor to see if they are uh, coming to upcoming conferences and asking if your book will be there physically present and or headlined in some way with a poster or in a prominent place. Now there's very little real pressure that you can apply here. The press will have made a decision, I think, in terms of you know, what books they're really promoting, what books they're really getting out there. 
Um, but if they're on the fence about whether to put your book in the front row or not, knowing that you're at the conference and this matters to you, you know, it can't hurt to gently remind them, I think, of that in the lead up to your book's publication. Uh, other I'm, things to, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to hop in. Yeah. Let's, I want to push a little bit more on this business with the press. So I understand that for many awards, for instance, it's really the press that nominates you. Uh, and, you know, so they're the one that actually formally nominate you for something, right? So. I understand it is perfectly fine to talk to your press and ask, would you nominate me rather than waiting for them to reach out to you, right? Uh, sometimes they ask you for colleague to nominate you or, or things of this sort. In other words, is there anything against you nominating yourself for, for prizes? First question. And second one is, if you could tell us a little bit more about this relationship with the press. I mean, they do have a marketing office. Is there anything uh, that one should keep in mind, or, or is there any danger into pestering them too much, you know, and to actually send them an email and say, hey, you know, can we do this? Can we do that? I mean, uh, in, in trying to push them a little bit more to collaborate, is there a danger in doing too much of that, besides the fact that they might not do it? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Here I have to tread carefully because my, my actually my own book editor for the book I'm finishing is, uh, is, uh, is among us. So, uh, so actually, I'll, I'll sort of send this over to Susan Ferber later. Uh, for, there you for are. That. Susan, kind of, yeah, um, <laughs> Susan can hop in. Um, uh, you know, my, my sense is that, you know, in terms of working with the press, that they probably have an idea of what the marketing plan is for your book, um, you know, and, they're, and how they're going to, you know, uh, distribute resources that are available and attention, et cetera. Um, so I, I, my own sense is that probably you have a, a really strong interest in maintaining a really good working relationship with the press on the stuff that really matters in terms of the content of the book. You know, is it taking shape the way you want? Is it happening especially on the timetable you want in terms of promotion? To me, those feel like the places where if you're going to push. That I think you both have, you know, more control over and also things that in terms of the eyes on the prize part of this, which is, you know, in terms of employment, um, I think those are really consequential. Um, but, but actually, Susan, do you want to jump in or I don't want to put you on the spot or other people that have had experience? Or not. <laughs> or not. Or, or I, not. I'm okay. happy to jump not in if you, if you would all like, um, but I'm also not a full part of the presentation. I was typing some things just to say I can save Q&A later because I don't want to interrupt the flow. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. When, when, when do we do that, actually? And I'll, I'll try to get through what I have uh, expeditiously yeah, you're, you're, so you're we have doing, time like such a smooth job i don't want to interrupt okay all right thanks susan um okay well let me keep going then so uh in in terms of uh uh the research having some plausible headline relevance you know you can think about timing a kind of public facing piece for the week the book is coming out now this can be very hard to do in terms of timing and the news cycle um you know particularly right now where the news cycle is changing you know minute to minute um, one thing I think it's important to do is to not try to overstretch the hook between the book you've written and the headlines. Editors at publications will see through this very easily. It isn't a good use of anyone's time. Um, uh, but you can learn the art of the op-ed from various different sources. There's the op-ed project. There are lots of places you can learn to do this. And they can help you figure out what is a plausible news peg that you can take your book and, and kind of talk about its relevance to broader public and current affairs. Um, uh, more plausibly still, I think, you know, there are all kinds of podcast interviews. Uh, there are possibilities, new books in history, thematically relevant podcasts, you know, so there are podcasts in your field um, that you listen to where they're interviewing authors, including academic authors. You can certainly pitch the producers of those shows and see if they'd be interested in interviewing you. Um, you know, and I would also remember to kind of not just to think about academic historical podcasts, you know, by academics for academics, but thematic ones, you know, so depending on what your book is about, you know, are there podcasts that are dedicated to that theme, even in a, in a non-academic context that you could think about. Um, so uh, other ways to try to get the word out uh, would be kind of semi-academic crossover journals online, things like The Conversation, Public Books and Aeon are all fantastic uh, sites uh, in which a lot of academics, you know, publish uh, pieces from forthcoming works or works in progress. Um, some of these publications have general editors. Some of them have thematic editors. 
uh, you know, you can find them, find their email address online and pitch and say, you know, would you be interested in a kind of, you know, short essay version from this forthcoming project and see what they say. Um, you should also look to things like university newsletters, alumni publications, and social media. Uh, again, through the publicity office can help. They're often looking for news, um, you know, when it comes to things like alumni publications, um, you know, they want to get the word out about, uh, you know, the kind of research and the kind of teaching that alumni dollars are supporting. So these are institutions that can overlap with your interests in terms of getting your work out to a wider public. Um, one thing you can do is to see if organizations that you're affiliated with uh, have a Twitter account or tweet out uh, about new books. Um, this, you know, they may not do this because they would have to do it for everybody and they may not want to be biased. Um, uh, the journals they sponsor may be reviewing these books, so there may be conflicts of interest, etc. But if you find that you're getting tweets um, from uh, me me you know, membership organizations that you belong to about other people's books, then there's certainly no reason not to ask the people in charge of those social media accounts if they couldn't get the word out um, about yours. Um, if you go ahead and do this, make a quick check to make sure your membership is paid up because um, if it isn't, they'll call you on it and that's not a happy moment. So just do a quick check to see if your membership dues are, are up to date. Um, okay, one very small thing, but I think an effective thing is just to remember to put a link into your book web page on your email signature, right? You're corresponding with people all the time. Um, some of the time their eye may go all the way down to the bottom of your email and they may see that you've got a book that interests them. And that's just a way that in terms of your everyday conversation and correspondence, you can be getting the word out in a way that's unobtrusive. Um, Okay, and finally, uh, you're going to want to work up uh, some kind of book talk. Uh, um, you know, it can be a kind of classic 45-minute job, job talk style from a piece of the work that is vivid and memorable and also conveys key themes, concepts, and arguments about your book. And, um, and then, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, you can take advantage of opportunities to give the talk to visit places or to drop in on Zoom. Uh, now, ideally, this talk is one that you've given and polished uh, before so that you've worked out the kinks and you can figure out where the kinks are and polish it up before you go on the road with it. Um, you know, how to finish on time, uh, how the PowerPoints uh, are going to work, etc. cetera. Um, so make sure if you're going to do this that you have the chance to kind of deliver the talk a couple of times beforehand. Um, and this does a couple of things for you, I think. It hopefully primes your interest and enthusiasm in the book. Um, it allows you to take on board uh, comments, suggestions, and criticisms, and actually work them into the book that you're still finishing. And it also allows you to uh, anticipate counter arguments and clarify unclear points, uh, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so all this is gonna kind of help you have a really uh, nice talk uh, before you get on the road with it. Um, okay, so the final section of my talk is going to be about these talks and, and kind of what they involve. Um, so a final way I think can be really effective um, to get the word out about your book is to actually visit places. Um, this has the advantage of getting your work out there. It can be very important in terms of building up your CV for your department uh, if they expect you to kind of have a number of invited lectures. Um, um, so what about Zoom book launches as opposed to in-person book launches. Uh, well, here I think we're heading into some new, you know, somewhat <laughs> frightening, but also somewhat exciting possibilities. Uh, we're already seeing university presses and departments setting up book launch talks, interviews, conversations uh, with new authors on Zoom in a number of different formats. So I think you can expect that in the next, you know, six months, we're going to see this develop as a major new part of the way academics uh, share knowledge. Um, I think the same rules of etiquette and approach apply as with more conventional talks in terms of knowing how far to push, not pushing too far, et cetera. Um, uh, we unfortunately live and work as academics in a hierarchical prestige economy, and I strongly suspect that we will collectively find some way to rank Zoom visits to campus lower than conventional visits when you get on a plane where there's a physical bulletin board, et cetera, where your you know, notice goes up. But I think we ought to collectively try to counter this as much as possible. Um, so along these lines, I would not for now, for example, put Zoom visits in a separate section on your CV. 
These are, after all, um, invited lectures and presentations, um, and you should treat them that way. So I don't think there's any reason to apologize if somebody invites you for a Zoom chat rather than flying you out to campus. And I don't think, um, until someone in your department says these belong in a separate line in your CV, I don't think you should. Um, now, because of the nature of Zoom and some of the awkwardness involved in lecturing over it, um, you know, uh, book events, I think, may evolve towards foregrounding discussion, you know, having your hosts have you send in a short excerpt for discussion uh, ahead of time, which, of course, has always happened. Um, so, uh, so the format's going to involve, evolve, but I think, you know, this is something that I think we can look forward to as something that, you know, despite the real limitations of Zoom and the problems, um, you know, book talks were always very, very hard to arrange logistically, and a lot of institutions didn't have the resources to do them, um, and that limited the ability of people to, to kind of get out there with their work. And so I do think there are opportunities here um, for, uh, for us to enhance this part of the profession in ways that are really intellectually generative. Um, now, again, with a book talk, whether it's in person or Zoom, I think it needs to be really polished. If it's sloppy or rough in any way, um, people are going to read it rightly or wrongly as a problem with the book, and it means that they're going to be less interested in picking it up or reading it. Um, in terms of tailor making your talk to specific formats or themes, if there's a lecture series, et cetera, I mean, this is a judgment call I think that one can make uh, depending on the time, energy, and, uh, and interest that you have. Um, uh, there may be venues that uh, are interested in one corner of your work, but that you may not be that interested in, and it may not be actually worth taking the time and energy to kind of participate. Um, that said, depending on your institutions uh, and their requirements, um, uh, you know, for tenure or promotion, uh, getting more talks on your CV in person or on Zoom might itself be valuable and expected. So you're going to want to check with multiple mentors in your department to get a sense of whether you have enough talks, whether you need more, et cetera, as a factor in your decision about whether to accept an invitation or not. Um, if you hear from someone you trust that you could use more talks on your CV, you want to take their advice very seriously. Now, one important thing to keep in mind, by this point, you are probably completely exhausted with your book, at least if you're like I was. Um, and it's totally obvious to you, the arguments are completely pat. But you have to remember that ideally, this is still going to be news to nearly everybody else. And so to connect to audiences, when you present, you need to reconnect with what initially got you excited about the project, about the process of discovery, about the realizations you made on the way, et cetera. Um, so when you're you know, approaching the question of giving visiting talks in person or on Zoom, you know, think of it as you are a guest, you've been invited, and you're sharing something. You're trying to make the case for your book's argument and importance, but you mostly just go and be excited about it. You be curious about the reactions you get uh, from people, but I wouldn't read into them too much when it comes to anticipating uh, what kind of reception the book is going to have in the future, as tempting uh, as that can be. Um, it can be really easy to generalize from a particular audience, um, but reactions can be quirky, especially to oral presentations where people tune in and tune out. So, you know, if it isn't a, like a rave response where everybody's completely excited on board, you know, there could be something happening on campus. The person who asked that cranky question may have indigestion. You just don't know. So try not to read too much into, you know, uh, any individual reaction that you're getting when you go on these talks. Um, now, because the book is finalized and in print, it can be tempting to feel like you have to defend it. And I would really try to avoid this posture. Uh, you want to remain curious about the work and about how people are responding to it. Um, and realize that what you're hearing back from people and your responses to them are actually a part of your broader thinking and your ongoing thinking about the issues that are in the book itself. So your book is not your final word on these themes in some sense. It's hopefully the best that you can do right now. And on some level, you're probably going to continue working on these themes. So this is actually, in some ways, the first opportunity, and it's a great one, to start refining your thinking towards the next phase of your research and thinking. So you can't improve or revise the book anymore, but don't let the discussions you have around these themes go to waste intellectually. Right? So that's where I think it's really important to not just see this as 
promoting the book, like, like you're kind of selling it, right? You're trying to do that, but you're also really trying to find out how people respond to the issues and themes and concepts that really uh, compel your attention. Um, so it's important to keep your eye on the ball here and the, and the ultimate goal. All you want from your book visit is to be on people's radar in your field as a book that they need to sit down with and read in the next year or so. And in practice, this means that you want folks to put your book on their next grad or undergrad syllabus, uh, the next time they teach the relevant course in your field, which in all likelihood is gonna be when they make themselves sit down and read it, at least if they're anything like me. Um, okay, um, a couple final points about kind of visits of various kinds. Remember that invitation culture can be quid pro quo to some degree. Uh, you may not be in a position to invite people uh, that invite you for various reasons, especially if it involves money and institutional support, but it's a nice thing to keep in mind. And if you can eventually pull it off where you can invite somebody who's invited you, I think that's a really nice uh, thing to do. Okay, uh, a couple final points. Bookstore talks. Um, so bookstore talks are a, a different format. Um, not all places have independent bookstores that will host academic history book launches, but some will. And if you are a patron of one um, where they have books like yours on the shelf, um, particularly close to a campus where you can guarantee to bring some colleagues in, there's certainly uh, no reason not to try. Uh, they'll post the book uh, online, they'll send it out on social media blasts, etc. cetera. Um, now in general, unless you're working on a kind of blockbuster headline theme, or you have an energetic colleague in the area who's gonna bring people out to a bookstore launch, the turnout can be very, very small and perhaps not worth the time and attention um, unless you're you know, also going to campus to give a talk. Um, so this isn't a reason not to do a bookstore talk, you know, the fact that there might be a small audience. I've given, you know, a number of these talks that have really infinitesimal audiences, um, and, um, and it can still be an energized discussion, and you can still really have a chance to communicate with people about your work and hear about them and their interests, and so, um, but just adjust your expectations uh, if you're going to do a, a book talk so that you don't really disappoint yourself. Um, okay, finally, should you... Um, get paid for these talks. Uh, if you're visiting the classroom of a dear friend for a 25 minute drop in via Zoom, uh, and you know they do the same for you, I'd say the answer is clearly no, right? That there doesn't need to be any money involved. Uh, but otherwise I'd say yes, even if the amount is fairly nominal. I say this because everyone wants us to do what we do for free. And I think we need to collectively fight back to make sure that our time and labor is worth something when it comes to giving these talks. After all, there are costs associated uh, with travel, especially babysitting, um, and there are also opportunity costs, things you can't do because you're traveling to somebody else's university. Uh, that said, we clearly get something non-monetary out of these exchanges in terms of the attention, the scholarly exchange, and the CV line. Um, and clearly there are other values in play, right? Underfunded institutions and departments that still want and need a lively intellectual life. And our desire to hear back from people about our work so that we can learn and improve on it, right? So um, only you can know for yourself what you can afford to do and how much or little you're willing to accept and how these, fits talk, uh, these talks fit into your life relative to other constraints and priorities. But I would say that in the interests of collective worker well-being, I try to insist on at least something nominal, especially if you're getting on a plane and there's a flight and there's travel, et cetera. Um, and, and finally, this isn't even something you should necessarily have to ask. In my experience, this is a standard thing that your hosts uh, suggest and tell you what they can pay when they invite. Um, but I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, okay, so just to conclude with um, a kind of overall uh, time frame and some concluding remarks. Um, so consider the launch of your book is taking place from around the publication date to about, I would say, a year afterwards. Uh, although for mass media outlets, the window is really something more like two to three months after the book comes out. I do think it's, it's okay to give book launch talks about your book roughly eight to 10 months after it comes out. Uh, but after that, I think you really want to be starting to present other material to show um, uh, yourself and others that you're a dynamic scholar moving forward to uh, other research projects. So how will you know you've done enough to promote your book? Well, you won't. 
Um, and while asking yourself if you've done enough to make your book a success is an obvious question to ask, it's not really the right question to ask because it presumes that the amount of attention and recognition that your book gets is something that you can meaningfully control. Um, it also, it's a question that sets you up to blame yourself if you don't feel like your book takes off the way you'd like it to, so, which isn't good. So, um, so I think some better questions to ask rather than did I do enough, here are I think some better questions. One, did I do as much as I had the time and energy for and was comfortable doing? Uh, second, did I take advantage of promising opportunities that came my way or that I helped generate myself? Uh, and third, did my efforts reconnect me to what's exciting about my work and why I'm dedicating my professional life to this enterprise in ways that energize me and propel me into whatever I have planned next? Um, in terms of reviews, academic reviews will come out probably starting six months after the book came out and it can continue for as long as two years. Um, don't consider any one review destiny in terms of how the field uh, receives your work or even a pattern of reviews. It can take a long time to figure out how your work has actually been received. And by the time you have a sense of this, however it shakes out, hopefully you're deep into the next project. And perhaps you can learn some things you didn't know about your work and larger themes from the reviews, even including or even especially from critical ones. Um, okay, um, I want to close with kind of a philosophical point. Uh, academic culture and reward systems encourage us to magnify the originality of our individual contribution and insight and to depict ourselves as kind of the individual heroes of our work of various kinds. Now, maybe hopefully you're not prone to this. If you are, you know, I try to resist it. Um, when you're on the road, electronically, in person, you know, try to use whatever opportunity you have in the spotlight to emphasize the broader field that you're working in, other exciting works that are emerging, and yourself as part of a team that's getting the work done. In the case of your book, if you've grown something exciting, it's because the soil was rich and it was prepared for you a long time before you got started in some ways. And a big part of our job, I think, is to leave the soil better than we found it for someone else. And so emphasizing that point, precisely when you get a little moment of spotlight um, on you and your work, I think can help make that point more deeply than at any other time. So in front of an academic history audience, I think the best use of your book talk, apart from hopefully raising interest in your book, is actually to point to promising, exciting directions you're hoping that someone else goes on to study. Um, this will communicate that you know your book didn't do everything, uh, that there's a teamwork dimension to everything we do, and it will also give grad students in the audience something constructive to take away. Um, although it may seem counterintuitive, the most important outcome of the launch of your amazing book may not actually be the launch of your amazing book. It might be the inspiration that you might be giving to some grad student in the room, maybe somebody you don't even meet, who goes out and writes their amazing book and launches it. So that's what I've got. Um, two quick things. Um, my website has some links to some other professional development talks I've given on um, publishing articles, on leading graduate seminars, et cetera. So if that is of any interest, check that out. Uh, it's paulkrameronline.com. Um, and second, I'm thinking of maybe doing some future talks along these lines. So if you're finding this useful, um, let me know and I'll see, you know, let me know what else you might be interested in finding out more about and I'll see if either I or perhaps somebody else might be interested in, in following it up. So, uh, so thank you all again for coming and I'll look forward to your questions and insights about all this stuff. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, if you have to come up with a clapping function on Zoom that can really be... <laughs> But but uh, uh, please please consider yourself thoroughly clapped, and and uh, I want to turn it over really quickly to uh, Susan Ferber, who happens to be to be tuned in, and we were chatting back and forth, and I said, you know, like we're, we're so happy to have you, and uh, for for the people tuned in, she's a uh, uh, our our editor, <laughs> we both published with Oxford mm -hmm. University Press. Uh, although I didn't work personally with her, I worked with one of her colleagues, but I know she has so much to offer. So Susan, would you like to to pitch in? Sure. And feel free to turn on the there you are. Hi. 
Sorry, I turned on my camera. I am um, clearly in super dress down mode with not planning on being on screen at all, but I'm thrilled to be able to join in and listen. Um, thank you both, um, Alaria and Paul, for, for doing this. First of all, the fact that you have 47 uh, different points people on shows how much interest there is. Um, so I wanted to just add a, a few things that, um, and I'm sure that my, my marketers would say, hey, you forgot like X, Y, and Z right after I finished this. But a couple of things I wanted to add. Um, first of all, I'm very glad, Paul, that you mentioned the slug line on email signatures, because I think that is the number one way of somebody who has like very, very shy tendencies like of getting the word out and saying, this is my new book and having a link. Have it linked to the press's website and not to Amazon. It's really important mm. not to um, be favoring one outlet over another, even if more people buy it over Amazon than any place else. Like Indies get pissed off about it. Barnes and Noble, which may not exist in two years right now, they'd be pissed off about it anyway. You want to give equal opportunity um, for people to buy. Um, a couple of other things that marketers do and um, and I think don't get credit for, and certainly it's all the stuff that's like sort of beneath the iceberg. There's a lot of really basic metadata things that, are, that go out so that websites have the correct information about your book. You can help in this regard. If you see things that are wrong, write in and let your editor know. These things get out there and once there's an error or bad copy or, blurbs that aren't there, you know, that stuff could be corrected, but we can't be everywhere checking all of it. So I would keep an eye on that. Um, if you are part of any listserv, Facebook or other uh, sites, this is the place where you can say, hey, my book is about to come out. Publishers can't do this for you. That's seen as advertising and mm -hmm. promotion and sales in ways that they will not accept from publishers, but they will accept from authors and are usually very happy to have people say. Um, your Amazon page, even though I just don't favor Amazon, you can have your own author site. You can build that. Publishers can't do that for you. So I would take advantage, even if you only have one book that's on your site, um, the more that you have on the site, the higher up in the rankings of the search engine you get with Amazon. If people have read your book, don't ask your mother to do this, but other people have read this, have them write in reviews. This automatically launches your book further up. When somebody does a search for any part of the keyword of your title, this is the place that it will help you elevate and get seen on page one or page two more quickly than you know if you don't have stuff on there. Some publishers have the opportunity to do A plus um, pages, which means putting up some images and doing other stuff to enhance your page. That too can help move, move you up. The question came up earlier, is there too much contact that you can have with your marketing department or your publisher? And the answer is yes. You do not want to be emailing them every day. You can put together a group of questions, and I think that that is far better received. And one of those things can be, what can I do? Now, your press may have a list or a site or other information they can give out with a shortcut list of all the things that they recommend. They may recommend things you've heard today or things that you haven't heard. Um, you can recommend your book to libraries. This is a really tough issue right now. I realize that many institutions come July 1st are gonna have their budgets reset. Those budgets are not gonna be pretty. Um, I know that the print buying patterns in the coming year, two years, possibly longer, are going to be down. But those libraries can, are, for the most part, patron-driven acquisitions, which means that if your friend has a book that's come out and you think your library should have it, you're recommending it, moves it up, the priority list for it actually getting bought in digital form, in an electronic database or in print form or all three if you're lucky. Um, so don't discount those institutional connections because your book will sell to some individuals, but ultimately you really want it in those institutions where other people can borrow it. Um, and that includes students of, of all different levels. I know that Ilaria brought up um, that it's really sad right now that we're not all at conferences looking at new books on the table and seeing what's coming out. And I feel particularly sad about this, which I think is why I'm tuning into like more Zoom things than ever. Um, most of the conferences that I, uh, that I participate in are doing some form of virtual exhibit. This may evolve over the coming months, but for the last several, there have been the OAH, um, LASA, and various other conferences. In fact, most of them seem to be doing some version where the publishers can at least post the new books. There's no priority that we can give. We can't put a stack of them out and our you know, sort of big hits like upfront 
but we can get books onto those virtual exhibits. And so far, uh, there have not been payments expected for these things. That may change. Scholarly societies are, are having a rough time, and some of them are, are having a you know, really bad financial um, you know, results of having to cancel conferences. So there are things that your publisher will be able to do with scholarly societies, and that's the kind of interaction that I would in encourage you to have with your editor slash marketer, because we can actually do something about that. Um, I think I'll stop there, even though I have other things, like I, the questions are much more important. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. thank you so much. Yeah, it's very, fantastic. very good to see you. And um, so, uh, please, please uh, throw questions in uh, on uh, in the chat, and I'll be uh, you know keeping a look and asking. I do have a couple of my own, a couple of points where I would like you to to elaborate uh, on while we're waiting for more questions to come in. The book launch. Let's talk about the book launch. So, I always heard about the book launch. And then when, when my time came, I ended up not having a book launch because fundamentally what happened, I'll, I'll confess my own case, was that, you know, I asked the press, but they said, well, you don't should be asking your, your bookstore. Then I asked the bookstore and then they said, oh, you know, um, you want to ask your institution. I asked the institution, they said, they gave me back to the bookstore. And then one thing or another, and more of the story, I ended up, you know, skipping, skipping my prom. And, and <laughs> yeah, you know, so what is the right way to go about this book launch thing? Does everybody has book launches? What's the etiquette of the book? How, how does this work? Uh, yeah, I think it varies a huge amount. I mean, I think it varies first whether it's something you want, right? I mean, there are people that would like to, would like to celebrate privately with their loved ones and family, and you know, have a party, you know, at home. I mean, that's a you know, uh, there are uh, there are people who want there to be some sort of public event that will allow them to speak in and invite people in. Um, I think it depends a lot on the on the available infrastructure in terms of you know, if you're talking about where you are. Um, you know, if is there a bookstore that will host it? Um, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, I think those are the kind of. I mean, how does it work, right? So, do you actually go ahead? You go to a bookstore and say, "Would you host my book launch?" I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, the, uh, to give the example, uh, you know, just provincially from my own experience, anecdotally, um, which was I happened to be living in a place that had a really wonderful used book, you know, in, uh, uh, an academic bookstore, an independent academic bookstore uh, wow. that was very much campus facing. It was sort of, you know, and so it was very customary for uh, faculty to launch their books. I mean, they, they were very well greased for that in terms of just the notion that you would come in and say, hey, my book is coming up, can we do something? And, you know, so in that, that was a very special case, I think, where this was something they were used to, and so it was not difficult. Um, okay. And then it was just about, you know, me kind of buttonholing my friends and getting the word out, and they, and they put the word out. So, um, you know, uh, so I, I guess I would say if you have a bookstore in your town, you know, that, uh, that would be interested, um, particularly one that's frequented by university colleagues who are probably going to be the most likely okay. people to attend, um, uh, you know, here in Nashville, we have a nice independent bookstore. It's a little far out from campus. It's about, you know, 20 minute drive, but it's still when, you know, my colleagues in the history department have a book, we get in touch with them. You know, we just say, you know, and mostly when they have book launches, they're doing, you know, kids books and cookbooks and, you know, um, yeah, suspense novels and whatever. But, but I think because they want to build a relationship with the university, um, they will allow, uh, you know, um, a book that's probably going to sell much less than those books, take over the space for a little bit, and a bunch of university people come in and, you know, and have some wine and celebrate. So I guess I would just say it really depends on the local infrastructure. Um, but if you, um, you know, if there's a, conven a congenial place, and particularly one that you frequent and, you know, or a patron and maybe a recognizable character, I think that's the way you initiate. Okay. So. No, thank you. That's very, very helpful. A uh, uh, um, couple, uh, two, two things. One, uh, I want to turn it over uh, once more time to Susan because uh, she wanted to make a point about prizes. Earlier, I asked a question about book prizes, right? Uh, you nominating yourself versus, uh, you know, should the press nominate you and anything else you want to add? And by the way, I threw in the chat a note about uh, the Coordinating Council uh, of Women in History, which offers a number of prizes. Deadline is the 15th of June. It's one of those places that Maybe if you didn't know the organization, you wouldn't have looked at, but they're there, so please, uh, please apply. Susan. Sure. So you should probably have some version of an author's questionnaire from your press, and on that, you will get asked about prizes. Um, you should make a list as comprehensively as you can. If you don't fill it all out the moment you send that in, you should take time and do it later. Um, there may be a limit on the number of prizes that a press will submit to. 
there are certain prizes that have caps on the number that they can submit to. So I would not expect that, you know, you will necessarily be uh, put forward for one AHA prize that only five books can get submitted to that year. That being said, prizes came up in the way before publication section, and that's indeed when to think about it. But most of the submission deadlines are months after, if not a year after publication. So the timing and the window may be, and usually is for prizes, um, on a calendar year basis where your copyright date or your pub date when the book comes out will not be eligible until the following year. So this is a long-term process, but I would definitely be in touch with your publisher about it. Uh, for the most part, they do not want you nominating yourself. Now, if there's a cap on the number of books, then yes, they may say that's fine to do. Um, but there are definitely um, many prizes where only the publishers can submit. There are a few where colleagues can submit, but not that many. And there's some that say self, um, uh, self nomination is fine, but you want to be in, in direct communication with whoever is doing that. And it may be editorial, it may be marketing, it may be publicity, it may be a prize coordinator, because you do not want to be double sending any prize entries. Like these books are expensive um, and you want to be very clear with the lines, but in general, that's a press's responsibility. Um, I do think this is a really important part personally for getting word out, even if you don't win a prize, that's a committee of three to five people who now know your book and maybe they didn't choose it because it didn't fit the prize so well, but they may put it on their syllabus or they may talk to somebody about it or they may when they give away those books to grad students or others after the, they're, they're finished with their review time, that's getting the word out. So I do think book prizes are incredibly important. Thank you, thank you so much. I have a, a number of wonderful questions and this is really how, how we were hoping this would work out. So keep them, keep them coming. So uh, it, first, invitation culture and polite self-promotion for in, independent and uh, you know, alternative academy scholars or independent scholars or people in a, you know, not quite in the traditional academic line as we think of it, right? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? And this is something that, that uh, particularly CWH cares very much about, the fact that we don't just think about the classic academic track, right? Do you think, how, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, I think the same, you know, uh, the same rules apply in terms of the kind of need to, uh, to kind of give your book a nudge, I think. Um, and in fact, you know, maybe more so in the sense that, um, uh, you know, there are all kinds of subtle and unsubtle um, uh, sort of strengthening effects that, that a conventional academic position can do. I mean, even if your university doesn't really notice that you published, but the fact that they've got a publicity office that can use social media, those kinds of things. So I think it may, um, it may require uh, an additional level of social media savvy and a kind of willingness to step out a little bit more in terms of um, uh, in terms of getting one's work out. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, I think they were asking about you know the etiquette of approaching colleagues in universities. Oh, and, you know, my guess would be that it's a bit like what you were saying before, right? Depending on the relationship, I imagine. Yeah. No, I think that would be a really, I mean, I think that could be a really especially important avenue to pursue, actually, would be to kind of, you know, ask people that may have a seminar, right, that convenes on your theme, if you can come and visit. Um, and again, I think the same rules apply. There's no reason not to gently approach people and say, hey, my book is coming out, particularly if you're corresponding casually about other professional things, um, and just see what they say, right? Say, uh, you know, if they say, hey, that'd be fantastic, I'm organizing a speaker series, or we're having a half-day event in person or on Zoom, I'd love you to join. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I feel like there, there, there are clearly people in academia, and we all know them, that are too aggressive on all this and too self-promotional in ways that are really annoying and frustrating and, and we kind of wish they would pipe down more. Um, but there are also people where, you know, like where really, really great work isn't heard from as much because the person, you know, is bashful about questions that are completely within their rights to ask. So, so I, I guess I would be, I would, you know, um, you know, particularly with people that you have solid collegial relationships with, um, I don't think there's any reason not to kind of, uh, you know, just drop them a line and see what happens. And I think that may be particularly the case, you know, if you're outside of conventional academic tracks. Yeah. Now, the next, the next question is one I really feel close to. So what about the fine line between advertising one's book too little or too much? And this person wrote, you know, sometimes I feel that that link to the email signature that you both refer to is a bit tacky, you know, or, or it, might, it might be a bit too much. Older colleagues may feel that way. 
What are your thoughts on that? I confess at times I thought the same thing. In fact, to this day, I don't have the email signature, but then again, I can feel the pressure, the same person. What, what are your thoughts? Some people may uh, hold that. For, my, for myself, I think it's just about your comfort level. I mean, it needs to be an expression organically of who you are and how you relate to the broader community. And, I, and so, you know, if that's something that you're not comfortable with, then, then don't do it. But I guess I would say, I feel like, you know, given that I've got some other stuff at the bottom of my email, you know, my department, my address for people that, I mean, so, and, and it's unobtrusive. It's literally a one line and you can click on it. So it feels- Okay, so it's not the, the cover with the picture and the-, the No, 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 I, yeah. I mean, for myself, I don't do all that because that does yeah. feel, at least for my comfort level, that's not kind of where I'm calibrated. Um, but yeah, but I think um, the, way I, the way I look at it, I mean, also just in terms of, um, yeah, I mean, that way people are curious. If they haven't heard from me before. They want to know who's this person who's emailing me. Oh, there's this book that looks kind of interesting. But, you know, so you're putting it in front of them, but in a way that doesn't hit them over the head with it. Um, so, but, I, but there's lots of gray area there. And I think it's just about figuring out what you're, what you're comfortable with. I, for myself, I guess I would say a minimalist approach there. Just again, you know, the attention economy is overwhelmed with spam and, and, and so I think we all have some sort of collective responsibility both to, you know, let people know, but also, you know, keep it in proportion. Keep it in proportion. And, and by the way, I'm, in this, I'm just going to say, because, you know, again, we thought we have a longstanding relationship for a long time. We talked about this all the time. None of this is meant to be prescriptive or, you know, a session in which we decide what's right and what's wrong. It's just that, you know, I felt as I, as I approached this process, I knew very little about. I ended up, you know, if anything, <laughs> You know, tackling Paul at conference and say, hey, what am I doing? And so we figure, you know, why not have these things more in the open? Why not talk more about these things? But, you know, I'm sure it's not your intention or mine to be at this point very prescriptive. If somebody feels, you know, I'm happy to do it this way, then, then that's, that's fantastic too. You know, just a way to share our wee reasons for this. But So somebody asked, you know, their book came out, uh, you know, seven weeks ago. They filled out the questionnaire, you know, the publisher questionnaire. And they ask all this information, the journals and all of these things. They say, should I just expect that now they're going to follow up or, or, on all of those things? Or should I check up with them? I can answer that question. You do want to check up. In fact, as soon as when I, when I did my thing and I asked and I asked my own marketing person, they said, you know, feel free to, if you want to, 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 you know, contact journals, to ask if they receive a copy and so on. And many of them actually that I had in mind and even others that I contacted said, no, we're not going to receive it. Please send it back. And I ended up actually, you know, then working with the publisher to have a lot of copies sent. So that's when I feel confident. That's the one thing. But what, what, what do you think? I mean, um, uh, um, is, there a, is there ever a publisher that just goes by the questionnaire and you can wait for things to happen? Yeah, I, I would say um, a gentle follow-up, I think, is, you know, can be worthwhile. Just because what you described there is um, something I've heard from other people, too, where they, they really think their book is eligible for you know, and a strong candidate for a particular prize. And they may put a list of, you know, 10 book prizes that they think that their book is eligible for. There's really one or two. And then they find out that by accident, the book didn't get sent out. And so that's a case where I do think a gentle follow-up to just make sure that, that everything happened um, can be valuable. And then, you know, I realize in my, just going through the process now with my own book, it takes a long time to look up addresses, to do, to email, to come back. And so it, it is understandable that, you know, a publisher cannot do this for, for everybody for endlessly. So at one point, it does make a big difference if you take that, that time, like you were saying. So now somebody else. This, oh, this, sorry, no, please listen. This review question um, really quickly. Uh, we're in a moment where nobody is where the offices of the journal are. Mm -hmm. Usually journals don't want to give away to authors or to publishers either where the, the uh, the name of the reviewer or what their personal home address is, um, I would tread very carefully. I would check in with the publisher. Some publishers are holding new books um, mm -hmm. before sending them out. There are different arrangements with different journals going on. It's all extremely individual. Um, but also on your author's questionnaire, you get a place to list um, what journals you think are the most likely. And I would take advantage of that and know that we are in this bubble and I don't know how long this is gonna last. I have obviously no crystal ball, but all of the usual rules about review copies are not being followed. I can't even get books to blurbers at the moment. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that just because of campus mail and office being shut down, we can't do the way we normally do. And you should expect that reviews, you said six months, Paul, for Choice, um, which is the Journal of Academic Libraries, the six months is a pretty good turnaround. 
um, I would say the two to three year mark is pretty normal. Um, and so unless it's major media, where there's that small window, you know, for the, the, the newspapers and the key magazines, when we're talking about academic journals, it's a much longer um, scope than that. Actually, I have a quick question on this point of the reviews. What are your thoughts on soliciting book reviews from people? You know, I, I received conflicting advice on that one. To, to go to somebody you know and say, hey, would you review my book? Yeah, I've also received these emails. Um, and I have to say, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I feel like that crosses a line for me, I have to say. Um, you know, in the sense that, um, you know, because it's making a presumption, right, about the person's opinion about your work, right? Because you're not presumably saying, please write a potentially devastating review of my book, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so, uh, so it feels like in terms of where at least I would want to draw the line, I think it would be raising awareness, right? And the person, you know, everybody's busy with getting their own writing done, people have decided what books they want to review that are a part of moving their agenda forward. And so there can also be a way that somebody coming in and say, hey, review my book, you know, is intrusive when it comes to the real time investment that it takes to review a book well, right? Um, uh, there are also logistical dynamics involved where, you know, in many cases, right, the journals approach authors for reviews. Right. It's not that authors approach journals. So there may not even be the possibility that that person could pitch a review. So that's a structural obstacle. But in terms of the interpersonal and the kind of micro political dynamics, I, I, that to me feels a little transgressive because it sort of essentially says, look, because we're buddies, number one, can I presume upon you to take however much time it will take? And the presumption being that you're going to like it, which in a way, you know, presumptively restricts that person's intellectual freedom, I think. Um, so, yeah. so, so I think I would, yeah, so I would, I would sort of, you know, raising awareness, getting the word out, but then letting people make their own decisions about uh, what they're going to review and what they're not going to review and, and not really doing anything to try to intervene in that. We have a, I know we still have quite a bit of time, but I do want to make sure we get through all the questions. So uh, and we have a good, a good number of piling up. So I'm going to ask you short uh, blurbs here, short reaction. So I've seen others sell their books at the book launches and then they collect the payments on site. How does that work? Does the you know, press, uh, ask the author, how does the book tour, you know, is the author there cashing in? Yeah, that's, that's a, um, a comfort level thing. And, and, you know, I, my own, my own sense is that you ideally are not collecting the money yourself. I feel like you are selling the book in terms of getting people excited about it, but ideally you're not actually selling it. Um, and so I guess I would say that, um, you know, if, if that's something you're comfortable doing, working with the local bookstore, then fine. But I, I think that, um, that uh, the better way to do it would be to, you know, I've had the case where there's, a, you know, a bookstore that actually sends somebody with a stash short stack of books and they can actually take, you know, run credit cards and do whatever afterwards and take, you, get an you know, swing yourself. Yeah, yeah. but you're not doing it yourself. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the way to do it, if, um, you know, if there isn't somebody that a bookstore or the press can send would be to just have one of the order forms. Right. You can have a stack of the book order forms or a publicity notice, you know, on the table so that afterwards that can be something people pick up and call an order or mail or whatever. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's probably. Like with the UP, they gave us like the flyers with the discounts, those kind of yeah, things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's now, very the, rare that bookstores will send people, uh, if they're not hosting, them sending out is, is pretty rare and the press is almost never going to send somebody over to do this. So you might be able to buy the books at your author discount, which will give you uh, somewhere between 30, 50% off, depending on what press you're with and getting mm -hmm. a grad student, a friend, a family member, somebody to sit at a table and take money is an alternative to you personally as the author doing that. Mm, that's a great idea. Now, somebody uh, mentioned that through, you, know, you can actually hire people to organize your book launches. I want to ask you quickly about an agent. Let's talk about the agent for a moment. Do you, do you have an agent? Do you pay an agent like this? Should we have an agent? What's the deal with the agent? Um, I guess, you know, it feels to me like there, for most academic publishing, there is no reason to have an agent. Um, um, in the sense that, you know, you can wor work on relationship, build a relationship with the press directly with an editor. Um, and, um, 
they're used to working with academics. In my experience, they like working with academics more than they like working with agents. Um, you know, agents' job are basically to be really aggressive when it comes to advances, royalty payments, et cetera. Usually for most academic books, the stakes there are fairly low. So the amount that an agent can actually bargain for you is not going to make up for the 15% that they take in my, you know, you know so I think. Well, that's already no. I mean, the, the exception would be if you are working with a trade publication, right? You want to publish with Norton, you want to publish with Basic, you know, then I think um, it can be helpful to try to get an agent, you know, because those big commercial presses are more used to working with agents. They may have, uh, you know, if they're interested in your book and there's going to be a very narrow bandwidth of books that they're interested in, there may be more on the table when it comes to royalties, advance, et cetera, in ways that would make it worth your while so that you would end up ahead even if the agent takes 15%. So I guess I would say unless you have some kind of like headline-y, you know, topic that you really think uh, a trade press is going to be interested in, um, there's really no reason to work with uh, uh, an agent. Okay. So um, uh, uh, there are a couple of comments that people put in. I just invite you to read them. They're not formal questions. So I'm going to focus on the question. Uh, does it undermine your academic credibility if you're appearing mostly non-academic podcasts or non-academic bookstores or if you do too much of the non-academic outreach? Um, I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it really hurts as long as your academic credentials are where they need to be. Oh, yeah. You know, I feel like, I think, you know, the, one can spend, I mean, all the stuff that I described today, of course, takes time and energy and, and there are opportunity costs involved in all that. And if doing some of this means that you are not getting the requisite number of academic articles published, going to conferences in the ways that your senior colleagues are expecting you to, then that's a problem. But I guess I would say, you know, working with your mentors um, and kind of chair and your trusted advisors and making sure that all of the academic stuff is checked off, um, then I don't think it's actually a problem. And, you know, and, and depending on the generation of the, of the people in your department, you know, for, I would say people under 50, you know, uh, it can even be an advantage. They can be like, wow, this person is really getting out there. I mean, there's more, mm -hmm. for better and for worse, there is um, a, a more taking seriously of the idea of a public in, publicly engaged scholarship. Um, and I, again, I, I, you know, I think there are trade-offs to that, but I, but I think um, the key thing is you, you know, you don't want lots of public facing articles um, on a CV and then like one published academic peer reviewed yeah. article where your department said you needed three, right? Cause then it just, as that becomes a narrative. Academic solid, then you can go yeah, wild with exactly. that. Exactly. Because what you don't want is a situation where that, uh, you know, where that disjuncture becomes a narrative, right? Of this person is not a serious academic and we can see on the CV, right? But Still I do feel like- Still on the non-academic thing, uh, somebody asked a question, <laughs> you know, about the op-eds, right? And, you know, the, the magazine pieces they feel unnecessary, like Trump just said this, and th which remind us all about my work on this, that, and the other. Now, I gotta say, I just wrote one of those. <laughs> like, like, I just written one of those because I kind of wanted to do it for the conversation. It was my first piece. And I loved it. I just loved the process. And then you get to see the number of readers going up and it was this fantastic experience. But it's an absolutely fair question, right? Should we be doing this? Should we be fine? We're encouraged to do this, right? So taking the last headlines and then whew, peace goes in the media. Again, what are, what are your thoughts? In short, because then there's another question yeah. I know you love following okay. up. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is something that I'm, um, so I gave, I gave a talk on this a couple of years ago uh, on this exact theme about what, mm. kind of how historians should, um, so I mean, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll promote, I'll, I'll direct people. I've got, it's a, 15 minute talk it's on my website and i think it's called something like you know historians and public engagement or something but in brief oh, yeah. i guess the gist i would say is um i think we as historians we know we use public resources um that could be going elsewhere we have public responsibilities um, um you know particularly as i was talking about as part of this kind of truth-seeking infrastructure that that a particularly democratic society needs so um uh that said uh, I do think that we really need to pay attention to the argumentative integrity of those public facing pieces. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because part of what I think our responsibility is to do is both to kind of raise people's awareness of histories that they don't know about, but it's also to kind of model and educate people in good historical thinking. 
And, um, and I feel like what I'm seeing a lot of in this op-ed world is exactly that kind of hook, right? Trump tweeted X this morning. It reminds me remotely of this thing I just finished a book on. And that to me does not model good historical thinking, right? That's essentially saying, you know, um, very loose historical analogies are valid historical thinking. And it's also a kind of transparently about promoting your book, right? And, and to me, that's, I think it's worth waiting to really find a connection between what's happening and the particular intervention that your scholarly work can make that changes the conversation in a way that also educates people in better and worse ways of thinking historically. And I feel like a lot of this op-ed universe that's been proliferating has lost sight of that, unfortunately. And so there has been a lot of this loose analogy in ways that, um, you know, can serve very short term promotional advantages, yeah. maybe. It's not really clear who's reading all these op-eds. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think it can be doing it at the cost of what we really ought to be trying to protect and cultivate, which is, you know, teaching people about better ways to think about the relationship between the past and the present. And in this kind of like lessons of the past, for example, right? Like we would never amongst ourselves say, no. right? Because I studied this, it teaches us lessons for, we would never do that, right? And if we don't do that amongst ourselves as scholars, I don't think we should be doing that with respect to the public. Well, that's we don't have a choice. You know, if you're arguing for a grant and they ask you to argue for impact and you hear all the Brits now are gonna, I know they're raising their hand as they hear me saying this. Uh, yeah, you, you don't have much of a choice. So, you know, it, it, sometimes you are a part of an infrastructure where, where you don't have much of a choice. Uh, two quick things I wanna say before uh, moving on to the next question. One, if you, Paul's website has been on my syllabus for a long time because it's got this series of talks under, I never remember if it's under speaking or professional, but there's the one about the bonfires that everybody should listen to. It's one of those things, which after I, I listened to it, I thought, ah, why didn't anybody give me that talk 10 years ago when I started this? And so watch the bonfire talk if all fails, but you, you might find some. Uh, the next thing I wanna say, the next question is about racial justice. And how do we connect this whole discussion with that? And I'm very happy to ask it to Paul because he has not only publication record that reflects concern with these issues, but also an activist record within our profession. And I know that the Schaefer part, but I know you were uh, outside of uh, Schaefer too, very active in increasing diversity in our profession in, in substantial ways. So the question is, uh, what are our responsibilities to the current and long overdue moment of racial justice, justice into the book publication world and economies of prestige awards? Amen. I rarely see editors of color in the systemic inequalities of academia, journal, and book review systems can't really be approached with an even measuring stick. How do we push for a change in the status quo in this area? Thank you for asking that. Yeah, that's a great what question. Are yeah. Um, so yeah, this is clearly a huge issue, right? And we're, we're, we're seeing more of this, I guess, in the trade publication industry, right? And some of the conversations that have been coming out about racial inequality and exclusion within the, you know, massively white, sort of trade publication industry. Um, but I think it's something that we need to pay attention to, you know, across academia and including in university publishing. And, and you know, in terms of um, ways that we as academics can have, um, you know, or scholars can have some entree into that conversation. I mean, one of the things I think that that we can do is look at the journals that we read and and the professional organizations that sponsor those journals and actually you know gather data about who the reviewers are and which books are being reviewed because often um what has come out of organizations that have done those studies is that there are you know very racially and gender determined patterns in terms of reviewing structures right which translates in all kinds of ways into power influence and prestige within the university uh you know within the profession so i think that's something where you know if within your particular part of the profession uh there are people that are willing to kind of do the legwork and the data analysis to kind of say look where what are the patterns of inclusion and exclusion and what you know where do they map onto and there are other you know indices as well in terms of you know, do people uh, pursuing alternative academic careers get to review books, right? Or, um, you know, the balances of junior and senior, right? So there are lots of different, um, uh, you know, ways to think about these, the patterns of who, because reviews obviously play a huge role in, in what books get attention, you know, what books are the, uh, the subjects of fora uh, and exchanges, et cetera. So I, I think that's something that 
Um, and then I think once we, you know, if we have information that shows that there are really problematic patterns, taking that up with the editorial boards uh, of journals that we subscribe to and, and membership organizations that we belong to, to, to really come up with a plan, um, uh, you know, for change and, and then to monitor that uh, in terms of accountability. So. Yeah. And I, I would like to add something on that. So I think that academic activism is the one that you are uh, talking about, which is sometimes initiated in the confederation. Shall we ch count how many reviews or journals have been published that have been written by this particular demographic? Shall we count? Sometimes it can actually be easier than one might think. And I know this just from my own experience with the, with, 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 with the women, part with the gender part of the thing, because fundamentally my story was that my committee, my pre, at the time was the, what is the pre-tenure committee thing said, you know, you shouldn't really become more involved in professional organizations. So I looked at all the ones I was a member of and the one that intimidated me the least was the coordinating council for women in history. So I shot him an email. So next thing you know, I'm sitting on the membership committee. Next thing you know, they started a liaison with the Schaefer and now I'm sitting on the Schaefer one. Then I become the chair of the thing. And then, you know, sometimes it, it, it moves very quickly after you're in. And sometimes it, all it takes is really to approach somebody and say, hey, you know, Shall we count how many reviews we have? And next thing you know, you, you came up with a spark and, and it flies like wildfire in ways that I never imagined before starting this. And the, 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 the courage of approaching somebody at a conference or shooting an email and say, you know, shall we have a talk about, you know, who's doing the reviewing? And next thing you know, somebody said, you know what, let's do that. And, and it does lead to change. In ways that frankly, I never thought it would happen. Or, or the mentorship thing, or, you know, in the end, you know, in short. Try it out because it might actually work <laughs> you know, in, in ways that, that one might not imagine. So uh, somebody mentioned the double blind reviews. And here I have a question that I think com connects to that. This is a problem I'm trying to figure out. So the open access versus the paid book thing, right? So I always thought that there was something very important about having blind reviews and good editorial processes. And through my own process, I came to appreciate that even more. I, I really have. And so I, I really, really struggle to imagine myself supporting a world in which we just get rid of any kind of check on that. And we just decided anybody can just post anything on the internet and without any, that, that scares me a lot. On the other hand, the argument you made earlier about Make putting your ideas out there and really making sure that, you know, the kind of civic responsibilities of, of uh, uh, you know, participating to the broader discussion and making it as inclusive as possible, like, like the comments we just, we just addressed, then would put, push more towards the open access thing, right? And publishing open access or buying, I don't, in the US it's slightly different. In the, in the UK, we really receive this strong pressure on, you know, making our books open access or having our university buying the right to the book from the college, blah, blah, blah. What are your thoughts? On the question of, 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 op, of open access publishing for our books specifically. Yeah. Or... Is, that, is that the ethical thing to do? It scares me, scares me very, very much. This idea of just getting rid of, you know, somebody would just said, you know, double blind book reviews sometimes can be really good. <laughs> you know, having a good editorial process. So you know, yeah, sorry. When you say double blind book reviews, do you mean that, yeah, so the, uh, I'm not sure how that connects to the open access question. Like the, well, the whole, you know, to have a solid peer review process, which, most traditionally happens through the more traditional right. market. And I understand that you can have, you know, an open access, different kind of modeling process that still has some kind of peer review, but you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is, I have to say, I haven't thought through very much and, and, you know, uh, you know, I feel like, um, yeah, on, on the one hand, you know, when books are made available, you know, inexpensively or free, as is happening with a lot of universities presses right now because of the COVID crisis, like I'm clearly the beneficiary of that. It's really, really helpful. On the other hand, I know that university presses like have to make money. I mean, as little of money as they often make, and they right. And so, um, yeah, I don't know, Susan. Maybe maybe this is something that you'd want to field more. Mm -hmm. And I could certainly try. So this issue of open access, I think, is, is a huge one and probably needs to be this, another segment for you. But open access doesn't actually change the peer review process and the, the, all the things that we do up to the moment of publication. It's only about what happens for distribution after. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of different pilot programs going on now. There's all sorts of, of different things, depending on which region you're in, that are going to vary. Yes, a lot of presses have opened up parts of their list or you know, in some cases, entire lists over, the, over this period of months, that's not a sustainable model. I mean, it's not at all. I mean, there were already like 
going back to last year, you know, presses, very prestigious university presses saying, our sales numbers are going down. How this is gonna impact them, I, I don't even wanna to begin to think about, but I would not expect that window to stay open uh, for free books. I would expect there to be, um, especially at the moment, there are a lot of books on racial violence and police brutality and current events topics that presses are opening up parts of those books for a limited period of time um, as books for understanding and about educating the public. And I'm completely behind that. And I've been really active with that. But I have to say this issue of open access and and uh, blind review, I would separate because nothing that happens in the okay. review process is, is linked to open access. Okay. That's, that is helpful to know. But just something to keep in mind. So um, question, the, that just came in the chat. So what about, what are your thoughts on books that uh, we can think of as crossover between the academic and the lay audience? Right? What are your thoughts on, on writing those? Maybe not as a first book sometimes because it's for tenure, it might be a tricky business, but uh, uh, what, what, uh... yeah, I mean, I, I, when it comes to the immediate question of, of promotion, I mean, I, you know, trade presses are, have a budget and an infrastructure for doing promotion on a much vaster scale. So, um, so a lot of the stuff that I've talked about in terms of, you know, nudging your book forward, I think there's less of that maybe that you, that you have to do yourself probably with a trade press just because it's something they're more equipped to do. I mean, I think the, the issue with the trade press, um, you know, there, there are some questions on the university end and there are questions on the press end. On the press end, you know, there's going to be a very narrow slice of things that academics work on that trade public publications are really interested in. Um, so they have to, you know, really be able to make the case for a book that needs to be in, you know, mass market bookstores, right? You know, uh, and so, um, and, uh, and in terms of the topics that we are likely to be drawn to as, as scholars, the Venn diagram there may be, be vanishingly small in terms of the overlap between what we want to work on and what they think they can get in a mass market bookstore. So, um, so uh, I mean, that's on the press end. On the university end, the issue is that I do think there are real risks in terms of coming up for promotion uh, with a trade book. Um, in terms of, you know, trade books go through, uh, you know, minimal or even non-existent academic vetting in lots of cases. Um, so in terms of the, the, the sense that your committees are gonna need that your book has moved through a rigorous peer process, there may be question marks that, um, that really can't afford to be there. Um, and so, so I would be very, I would be very wary about publishing your book with a trade press, a first book, um, you know, if you're moving through a conventional academic promotion track and there may be people that, I would say that that doesn't apply if you're pursuing an alternative career where that's not going to be, where that question of a committee sitting down and saying, you know, has a rigorous group of three or four people reviewed this for a press, um, that question may not be there. And in that case, if there's an overlap between your topic and some kind of sexy or headline kind of issue, uh, then there's no reason not to talk to a trade press. Um, and, um, and that is a way to kind of participate in a public arena for better and for worse uh, is really streamlined when you work with a, a, a trade press. I just remember, I mean, when I was trying to figure out a press, just very briefly anecdotally, I was presenting, I think at the OAH or something, and I had given a, my, a talk on the Philippine American War and I had a couple of juicy quotes from Theodore Roosevelt, you know, um, reflecting on the war. And this, you know, very snazzy trade editor came up to me afterwards and said, like, you and I need to have a meeting right now because I'm going to publish your book. This is fantastic. Like, and I was so excited. I was like, wow, this is going to be amazing. You know, and so I, we sat down and it was like the shortest coffee ever. It was like embarrassingly short because basically he said, okay, first thing, we're calling your book Roosevelt's Empire. How do you feel about that? <laughs> and I was like, mm, you know, Roosevelt's in there. Like, he's a pretty significant figure, but it's not a book about him. And he was like, okay, can we put Roosevelt in the subtitle? You know? And I was like, no. And, you know, and then I began to talk to him about what I was trying to do analytically in the book. And his eyes were glazing over. And then it just realized we're doing two different things here, right? Like, he really wants a book about. Theodore Roosevelt that he can get, you know, reviewed everywhere and 
on the bookshelves facing, you know, face out. And that's not the book I want to write. And it's not the book that's going to get me promoted. So, um, so I think, I think that is probably not an atypical experience for people where there's some aspect of your project that catches the attention of a trade editor potentially. But once you sit down and really hash out what the book is about, and what you wanted to do and what you needed to do, it's going to be different from what a trade editor wants it to do. So, and it's a, you won't believe this, but our time is up. This session flew. The time was so quick. I do want to uh, add a short comment to what you just said, though. I know many people here. I know actually many of the people here, and and I know that some of them are planning on publishing on, on trade presses for a number of different reasons. And I don't think that what Paul just said now is to diminish or to exclude the fact that there might be a trade press that actually is very uh, committed to to uh, publishing a good work or a, or a work that actually will reach a broader audience and everything else. But I wonder if one message tonight, it's certainly a message I heard a lot monitoring all the other sessions that we did with CWH, is that on one hand, it is what we wish the world to be. And then on the other hand, it is what the world actually is. And so in what we wish the world to be is that, you know, the, the prestige thing is not what determines everything. And, uh, you know, people are open-minded and they will look at CVs with, you know, uh, uh, an open mind. And, they will, and we should strive to make sure that we tear down many of these barriers. But I also think that particularly if we come from, um, you know, this adventure background, we really don't want to end up shortchanging ourselves by making a choice that might, might, might simply not be pragmatic at that point. And so, you know, deciding to publish with a trade press, you know, the, the, my even best, might not be the best step if you're trying to get tenure at a very traditional institution. People might not have the, the openness that you have in mind. Or you might be committing yourself to one path or, or, or over another. You know, prestige does have a big, big value. And, and that's just a fact. And I think that the very, you know, we might want to decide to change that. But meanwhile, that, that is there. And I think we should learn how to, to use it, to empower people and not to pretend it's not there because that, that might not lead us very far. Um, yeah. yeah. Just a, a, a couple of, um, of the, yeah, people are commenting exactly on that point. Our time is up. I don't want to, I don't want to steal anymore. I really want to, want to thank you all, all of the people who tuned in, you know, Paul, of course, for, for his generosity as always, Susan for pitching in. And, uh, and thank you, you know, you made my life, my, my life, my, my evening nice. It wasn't the, the best day between the child caring and the trying to finish the admin and all these things and to talk about things that, you know, are positive and it is about writing a book and getting the word out there and, and, and in many ways, you know, moving, moving along uh, in, our, in our career even at this time did feel good and I hope it felt good for you too. So please don't hesitate to email either one of us and, uh, and again, thank you, thank you very much. You, before you log out, you might want to um, ch look into the chat because some people have been uh, writing some really, really excellent comments that uh, they might be helpful. We are recording the session. I think it's gonna end up on your computer, Paul, and then we can, I'm not sure about what's gonna happen to that recording, but it is recorded for posterity. Okay. For posterity. And so, any final thoughts or? No, uh, yeah, thank you all for, for coming. And yeah, I hope this has been useful. And um, yeah, please follow up if I can be of additional assistance. But yeah, good luck, good luck, and best wishes for everybody. <laughs> well, good night, uh, good day, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>